Hi guys, welcome back to the podcast. Before we introduce our next episode, just to ask you for a small favour, I really appreciate the hours that some of you are investing into watching the podcast that we've done in the past, but I'd like to ask you to do me one favour that would take you seconds. If you enjoy the show, please hit the subscribe button, and if you enjoy any show in particular, please click on the thumbs up. It'll make a massive difference to the podcast. So thanks very much for your continued support, feedback, and I hope you enjoy this one. Hi guys, welcome to the latest episode of the podcast and this uh, episode is brought to us by Gemmel's Van Sales down in Kilmarnock who have been kind enough to help some sponsorship, um, a used car, uh, de- uh, sorry, a used van dealer um, with a stock of about 60, 70 vans and been looking at their stock, talking to Jim the owner, uh, good people and good selection of vans if any of you need it, I'll put a wee link in the comments for anybody that wants to check their stock. So um, on with our guest today, fantastic uh, guest for you again. Um, thanks very much for coming in, Bob Malcolm. How are you, Craig? I'm very well, mate, yourself? Good, good. A bit cold this morning. Oh, it's freezing. <laughs> Getting I've got shorts on as well, it's Baltic. I noticed that when you came <laughs> in, I thought you must have left the house in July. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Bob, uh, thanks very much, as I say, for coming on to the, the podcast. It's been uh, great to support with the, the guests we've had on coming on, so thank you very much for doing that. Um, and I'd like to just go through your life and career just in chronological order. It's the most uh, logical way and uh, tries to, you know, keep keep things simple for, for us. Um, so, um, where were you born, brought up, and what was your early football looking like? Uh, well, born, born in Bristol, Brighton, uh, for the first maybe couple of, couple of years, and then moved to Denison, and then Denison to Springbog, and then that's where I've been, well, my family's been ever since, uh, and then got to football, started playing in the school with my pals, obviously in the playground and that, and then uh, I, I don't I went, my first club was Blue Star, but I don't really know how how I ended up there. I don't know if it was somebody in the school played for them or whatever, and then I just tagged along and uh, just went for there, basically. Uh, Blue Star there up in Easter House, aren't they? Uh, I, I seen Derek's podcast and I seen he, I think there was two different ones. That mine was Rikese, right. the Hubbard Rikese, uh, which made it a wee bit difficult for me because I was for Spring Boy and they used to fight with Grand Hill, so I had to try and sprint through the, up the street past them all before I could get training, but uh, no, that was that was a good days and some great great club. I don't know even know if they're still going. I know the hub not still there, but uh, no, it was a great club, great people. What age would you have been when you started getting involved with organised football? That must have been must have been early doors, Craig. Uh, uh, I can remember playing. Obviously, that bit of strength, eleven a size. It was near like sevens and nines back then. Uh, so it must it must have been before I was ten because I got picked up with Rangers when I was ten playing for Blue Star. So it must have been eight or nine. Maybe, maybe 10. And what age were you when you got under the radar with, uh, with Rangers? That was it, 10. 10. Uh, we played we played a game against uh, Rangers Boys Club in a cup game. Uh, and the battle was 10 now. Or 10 1, sorry. Oh. And I scored the goal and played well in the game and then got picked up in that, during that game. Uh, and then got asked to come in and train twice a week with them. That's how it started. It's a fair commitment for you were 10. And who, can, back in your sort of 10, 11, 12 year old, um, what sort of players were playing me at the time? Are any of them going to make a grade? Uh, Blue Star, no, no really. Uh, it was mostly like scheme boys that, and then they ended up going and doing their own thing. Uh, but put them in a bit to Rangers. It was like the boys like Peter McDonald, Steve McAdam, Kirk Willoughby, uh, Big Mark Brown would have been there. Because it was a wee bit later, uh, so good, good group, good group of players, and they all came through the system together. And where were you training and playing at the time? What, what facilities were they using? They used to train at the, the community centre across North, oh, the yeah. community centre across the road Firebrook. So we'd go there on a, maybe a Tuesday, and a, a Thursday, uh, and then again you'd see it was a great experience. Cause we used to get like Johnny Hubbard, old David Wilson. They used to be, they were always there. And then they would come out and speak to you, and and probably we'd never even really knew who they were at that point. Uh, and then as when you go on in life, you go, "Ah, fuck, say that boy used to sit with us and like gaze his time, mm-hmm. talk talk to us and stuff." Uh, so it was a great experience. And then S forms was that still a thing at the time? Yeah, S forms. So we we probably I think S forms was classed as when you were in training with Rangers Tuesday Thursday. That's what that was basically classed as an S form. I don't really, I don't know if you'd be signed in. We used to play in a 
a Sunday. So we, we would play with school teams on a Saturday morning. Then uh, Blue Star, they started off Blue Star uh, Saturday afternoon. And then I ended up going to Rangers Boys Club. So then we played for them on a Saturday, uh, Saturday morning. And then it would be Rangers Select on a Sunday. So we were playing two, two three games every weekend uh, and training. And then... Obviously, you progress you through into the ground staff at the margin, so an apprenticeship type thing um, before you become a professional. So, when did that happen for you around about what, 16? Uh, I was a wee bit earlier. I remember uh, going into uh, doing work experience at school and uh, I asked if I could go into Rangers, and they said no problem. So, I got a, a week's work experience. Uh, but I can always remember, I think that must have been 15. And uh, Pierre McDonald, he was he was always like up there. One of the he's one of the best players that I played with when I was a, like, younger. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can remember he got brought into playing. It was a old firm game at Ibrox, and it was on Sky. Uh, sorry, Parkhead, and he went through and goal, and he like flipped and a mad flick, and ended up you know the goal and getting in. And uh, I can remember him running away celebrating and thinking, I want to be part of that. I want I want to be like that. And uh, and then a couple of weeks later, I was. That the both of us went in at the same time. He went in two weeks before me, and then I went in two weeks after him. So, so you're that, a, that was a start at fifteen. I think. You're a Rangers fan. <clears> that's <throat> fair to say. Um, you played with Rangers a few years. You know, um, the, um, kids for youth football. See, when you get told we want to sign you, how's that news delivered, and what's, it, what's going through your head at that time? It's it's a nightmare. I can understand where. Kids and parents knew they don't they don't want to like their kids just football and that's it. When I was growing up, I just wanted to play football. I didn't have a I didn't care about any other uh, any other work. And to be fair, I was lucky. My head teacher, he was a Rangers fan, and he knew, so he he kind of uh, pushed me. And he, like, he knew that I wasn't like sticking in at school. Uh, but it was I can remember because all that at that time it used to be going to Ibrox up into the at the manager's room, sign your contract, and then uh, you were buzzing, you could take your family and that. And, but another never handled that for me, because the day that I was going to sign, Rangers had a game. So the manager and that wasn't there. I was like, I couldn't give a shit. I was going in, I was making sure that contract was signed. So I think Bomber, Bomber done it for me. Uh, but it was a foul, getting into the, like the Walter's office downstairs, coming into the room and like, you, oh, you and all your teammates are there. So there's maybe, 15 years waiting to go in and see Bomber and John McGregor. And then the key you didn't know that yet, right, we're we'll, we'll signing you. And you're like, oh, thank fuck, man. It's just like a weight off your shoulders. But then obviously that everybody was in the luck like that. There was maybe we'll see that we had a good a good group, so maybe about 10, 10 years all get signed and they let some go. But uh, you know, it's, it was never anything. And is this a 15 going on 16 years old yeah, time? That would have been even though I was in a wee bit earlier, the contract wasn't signed until you were 16. Yeah. So I probably had that wee bit of, like maybe four months or something, ahead of the boys where I was in training full time. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, you know, probably a funny thing to think of now, but can you remember the, the, the amount of money per week at the time when you were signed that first thing? I can it was, uh, the first year was 62 Was it 62 or £62. Then the second year apprentice was 82 50 But you got travelling expenses. Mm. Uh, but yeah, everybody everybody was on the same so it didn't matter if you were the best player or the worst player you were still getting the same money and then de- depending how far you lived away your, your travelling expenses so so when you're, when you're 16 <clears throat> it was a two year contract you, you, two year yeah and then you're basically you know between now and 18 I really need to, need to show here and, and, and get on about it so what was what was that next next couple of years like between, you know, between 16 and 18 and, and getting to the point where you're signing up you know a proper that's it Yep. About it, was, it was good because obviously you're on, you're on, even though you're playing, you're, you're doing a job, you're, you're kit man, you're the boot boy, you're, you've got a job, so you need to be in there at eight o'clock in the morning. If your late bomber's got you in the treadmill or the, their own machine for half an hour or an hour, punishment. So everybody was bang on, just always wear a shirt and tie. Uh, same as the first team. You, you had to be at it or. or Bomber wasn't scared to just say, right, you're not good enough, on you go, even if it was two months into your contract. A few boys get let go straight away. Because uh, you, you can't, you can't, some people can't handle it. Because you're, you're, no, you're not in the, 
you're not getting told what to do day in, day out. And then as soon as your people's on your case, then some people crumbled. Mm. Uh, and some people right, rose to it and, and got through it. So, Balmer mentioned was uh, the youth team coach at the time. Is that when him and John McGregor worked together? Yep. Or that about the same time? I think a lot of people forget or don't realise that, that Bomber was a coach. He went on to manage as well, uh, Dundee and whatever, um, later on. Most people remember him for obviously his playing days and you know, some people remember him for you know, the protests and stuff and standing up against Craig White and one thing or another. But what was it, what was it like as a coach? One was brilliant. He was brilliant. Uh, obviously played the same position as me, so he helped helped me along. Me and Morris Shaw was big Andy Debbie. He would take us to like, sessions ourselves and stuff. Uh, but he also had that bit about him where he knew what it, he knew what it took to be like at that, that level to go to the first team. Mm-hmm. And uh, even to play in the reserves when we were in the, in the youth team, you had to be better than everybody else because at that time you had Durante, Charlie Muller would probably be still been playing in the reserves at that time. Coffee, Stuart McCall, well, they went, if you're coming back for injury, you played in the, you played in the reserves. And uh, you try to get in that team because it was, it was a big squad and... That that was a good thing as well. You were playing with these guys, mm. even though you're 16. You're playing with Durante when he's coming back from his knee injury, uh, getting to experience what it's like. And did you go straight into the reserves after signing your first apprentice contract, or did that take a wee bit of time? And, uh, I didn't go straight in. We, we played because obviously you've still got when you sign in 16, you've still got apprentices that are there been the year before you, mm. so they're, they're like a year ahead. So they're they're playing in the youth team and the reserves. Yeah. Then you're coming in and trying to just get into the, the youth team. But I think for for a few years it maybe took us a couple of months and then like because I was I went in like started as a striker but end up midfield and then back centre half. And then when I played with reserves, I was playing like a right wing but wrong, uh, sorry, right wing back because Bomber Bomber and that were playing, he was still playing at that point. Mm-hmm. So they would play free to back and then I would play right wing back. And uh getting to like what you said earlier, you're getting to learn different uh, positions. So it was good for me, but uh, I'd say it was the same. But you, you, you can you, you rise up to it, even though Bomber was hard. It was brilliant and it was fair with everybody. I think because he's playing time and then, you know, the time he's, he's done with sort of protest and, and uh, stuff, people don't appreciate how a knowledgeable coach um Bomber, has anybody you know, I talked to him, you know, tactics and coaching and, you know, I just pick everybody's brains because, you know, so I run a kids football club. So for me, it's just, it's great talking to people like yourself that, you know, um, been in the game at a, a great level. And I think it's, it's underestimated, to be fair, as a coach. Um, do you agree with that? But, you know, you, you get better to, to, to gauge that than me, you coach, 100%, man. 100%, 100%. I think, like, yeah, I don't get the credit. If you think when, when he was a coach, the youth team, him and John McGregor, how many players actually came through at that point? Loads. And they might only have played two games or three games, but there was loads of players that came through under them. Uh, and, that, and that's what it was. It was the coaching. It wasn't the, like, they don't have curriculums now where you need to work on this for a month. You need to work on that for a month. If you were shy at defending, then you worked on defending. And then you went forward for there. And that's what, that was a good thing. Uh, and it's something that doesn't happen now. Do you think, no disrespect to anybody that's a youth team coach just now, but do you think we've got enough of John Browns and Ian Durant and people with yourself that have got you know hundred plus game experiences playing for Rangers and to a certain extent know what it's all about? Don't it's not just thinking they know what it's all about. Do you think we've got enough of that just now? I don't think so. No, I don't think we've had enough of it for for years. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> and I understand that they've got a they've got a system in place where. They, they, they like to do their own thing. They've got curriculums now, but what I said, uh, and, they, and they stick to that. So they, they've got coaches in that they think they can that can do that the best. But I think you need, even if it's not a coach, even just to be somebody to bounce off. Because mm-hmm. I know that Bomber's been in and spoke to kids. Mm-hmm. And he was telling me a story yesterday where yeah, it was the time in Billy Gilmore that was there. And, and he speak to them. And uh, he said to them, how, how many are going to play for the first team? And one one player put his hand up. One one player. And bomber ran to battle the other fifty. <laughs> so one player puts his hand up and it was it was Billy Gilmore. And he ended up saying to them, 
what is the point of you being here mm-hmm. if you don't think you can get into the first team? Mm-hmm. He says, in third play to that, that, wee, that boy, he says, for putting his hand up because he knows he knows now that when you go into the dressing rooms, they're going to rip the shit on. Mm-hmm. He says, yeah, but yeah. fair play to him for actually putting his, putting his hand up. Look where he is now. That, that's a weird thing because it must have been a fair group of you. If it's one squad, you're talking about <laughs> 16, 18 players. And uh, so maybe they thought at 14 or 15, whatever age they were, then. Well, they, well, at that point, is that's they made it? Is that maybe with a lot of young footballers are today? I, I think so. But I, I think that was something back in the day as well. I think if you were, no, no, so much you made it, but like when you actually did make it, it wasn't a, a big, massive thing because you, you're you're in the system, and even though you're 16, you're you're playing with 18, 19, 20 year olds, and then obviously the adults when like they were playing the reserve games, so yeah. you don't, they don't get that exposure now. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit scary that uh, you think uh, you know, I live a club like Rangers, but um, I've been fortunate in the last couple of years that I've been out to Benfica and Real Madrid and these places where club uh, with kids. And the one thing that got me, when you look at the guys that involve with other youth teams, the vast, vast majority of them are ex players of their clubs. Mm-hmm. And again, that doesn't mean you know if you're a coach that didn't play for a Rangers or Real Madrid or a Benfica that you're not a good coach, but these clubs. It's institutional clubs, as it, as it were. They're different. Rangers are different for Dundee United. It's different for Hibs and Hearts. It's just, that's just a fact. Yeah. There's no point in debating that with anybody. Um, your Real Madrid and Benfica, they're different level clubs as well. And I think you, not only do you need to have a good understanding about football, it helps to have a good understanding of that club, the ethos of the club, the history of the club. And, you know, I thought Benfica was some set up, and you know, they are. Um, then we went to Real Madrid uh, a couple of months ago, and it's just a different level again. And if it's good enough for Real Madrid and Benfica, then why is it not good enough for Rangers? And I think there are some very good guys involved in the Rangers youth set up now, but it's just something that I think's uh, missing. But um, when when you made that first step up to play for the reserves, can you remember who who was um, in the, the Rangers team at the time? Yeah, I remember it was uh, Anthony Emmy was in goals. Uh, Bomber was playing. Gordon Petrich, uh, yeah, it was Big Scott Wilson. Uh, I think the Stolly Stensas, yeah, yeah. That, the yeah, uh, Stuart McCall, Charlie Muller, Durante. Uh, okay, Bomber ended up getting goals because Anthony didn't get injured. We didn't have a sub goal, so he ended up getting goals. Uh, is any good? He was all right, eh? he was all right. Uh, but that was, that was my first reserve game and just an eye opener. And they're playing against. It was, it was Hearts we were playing at, at Bathgate and you're playing against guys that play for their first team mm-hmm. so it's not as if you're playing somebody at your own age yeah. which is again an eye opener because you're thinking watching these guys in the telly all the time and then you're playing against them In what position did you play that day? Right, right wing back Did you start the game? Start aye And um, see, see that team <laughs> see any other uh, game run about that time if you if that was a Rangers starting 11 nobody would really raise an eyebrow in half of their names no, they, 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 they were playing Short McCall, he maybe had a he was out for two or three months with a knee injury, and then he came back two games in the reserves, and then he was back in the first team. Mm-hmm. And it was the same with all, all the players, Gordon Petridge, maybe have been suspended or something, Aye. playing in the reserves just to get his match fitness then back in the first team. So there weren't yeah. there was players that weren't the like just squad players that they said these were guys that were starting all the time. Yeah, yeah. And did they learn much during that process? Uh, that's how I think that's how you learn you learn the game, you learn more about the club, more about you. Because you're a Scared wee boy, do you know what I mean? Playing with the first team, you don't want to shout to them. But then Bomber has a go at you if you're if you're not doing it. So you end up you do it. Cause used to be there used to be an unwritten rule in training that you can't tackle the first team. You don't you can't smash smash them or anything in training. So you you're only tackling them. And uh then Bomber's like, no, that, that rule's out the window now. If you're in playing then you're you're tackling. So but <laughs> They didn't like it. The first team they like it if a young a young boy was taking a ball off them or tackling them. That was just one of the things. So between so making your debut for the reserves would have been about sixteen and a half ish. When did what age were you when you made your first team debut? Uh, I think it was late seventeen. It must have been eighteen. It maybe eighteen. Uh, but I played in a. I remember going to a reserve. No, a reserve game. It was a. It was a game at Christmas when the, like now you see all the pitches used to be frozen and stuff. And uh, Walter managed to get a, a game against Ray Rovers. But at that time, used to ca- the youth players used to carry the like the hampers mm-hmm. and stuff. So 
I, I helped, I was helping with Jimmy Bell that day. And uh, Archie said to me, like, bring your boots now, you can go and do the warm up and kick, have a kick about. <clears throat> and uh, I, I went out and done the warm up and I came back in and done the team talk. And he's like, right, you're, you're, you're playing. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I played right back. And uh, that was an eye opener because that was like, loud jumping all that were playing in Gaza. Uh, it was a little mix of the, the first team and a couple of the younger boys. And uh, I remember I was playing against Kevin Tordo oh, yeah. and he was absolute rapid. And uh, they were just putting the boy on my head for the first 10 minutes and he was sprinting on and they crossed into the box and the goalie was in goals and he's, he's shouting at me, for fuck's sake, Bob. I don't know what you want me to do. He's fucking faster than me. And uh, for after 10 minutes, he's come out and he's, he's put his hand on my shoulder and he's been like, listen, see the next time he gets the ball his feet, smash him. <laughs> I went right, so I smashed him, and uh, and he's like, "That's what you do. You can't no come near you again." Now. <laughs> I'm like, "Brilliant!" But then it got to half time, and I, and I was struggling. It was, I was too. It was, the level was too good. Even in that, Kevin Twardo, I don't even know what. I know he played the mother on that, but I don't know what division referrals were in at that point. If they were in the Premier League or if they were in the first division. And uh, it was just, it was too good for me at that that point, and. Then, Obviously, what one actually seen that and they took me off at half time. Uh, but what an experience being in the dressing room and, and seeing all the guys how, how it works. And was that long before you made your first first um uh, that was, first team proper? That was probably a good year and a half or something before that. that so you must have been sixteen then, eh? I was well, I was maybe just turned seventeen. But it wasn't it wasn't expected. But that's that's what used to do, it's used to throw people in. Well, right. Um so uh, you know you're you're playing with the reserves, youth team, um, training all the time with the first team, getting flung in at uh, Rafe Rovers and that sort of stuff. Did you have any like, trips and stuff like that to that age? Could tournaments going away? Was that a thing back then? Aye, we went. Bomber took us to Australia, took us to Chile, Seb Rosenthal. Played a couple of, like, a, a, like a wee mini tournament. Uh, unbelievable place. And to be fair, Seb's dad was, was minted and he looked after us. Uh, but I can me remember going to we went to Australia. We played against the Australian national team twice, and Northern Spirit. We played against them, mm -hmm. so we were only kids. We were we were in the youth team, and uh, it was playing against their under twenties, and then Northern Spirit's first team, and that's when the club put the, like, the link with them, mm -hmm. uh, and that's when I kind of got got noticed a bit because we were trying to sign a boy that played for Australia, a big boy. I can't remember his name. Bojic or something. He played with, he played for a team in Croatia, Croatia Zagreb or something. Yeah. And they were trying to sign him. And then Bombers came back after that tournament and says, Look, we've just seen him and we've seen Bob playing and Bob's I had them just now for us. And that when I came back for that tournament, that's when I got pushed into the first team and training with Dick Advocate and that. That's incredible. So at this time, I think your age and what year it would have been, who who was it? The uh, Walter Smith was the first team manager at the time. No, he was what well, had left at that point. So right. that was that kid just coming. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was uh, that was just early early on in his. Was that a culture so, shock when the little general turned up? Uh, well, it, not, nothing really changed for us because he was just he was more involved in the first team and never really took more, uh, anything to do with us. The first team had when the training ground was built. The first team went there, but the, the reserve still. We only get changed there, and then we still had to go and train it. Jordan Hall or West of Scotland or wherever. So they, they were apart for us. And that was the drive because you wanted to be there. And and Dick was good that way because he used to he kind of played where he'd a wee bit. So he would maybe take me training Monday, Tuesday, and then he would leave you back on a Wednesday when you think to yourself, I'm going to train the first team today. And then he would go like, like Andy Devil, you're training me as a day. So that way kept you hungry. And he'd done that way. It was it was mostly at that point it would have been me. Uh, Morris Ross was involved. Uh, Big Andy Dewey used to train with him. So it was about four or five as they would bring up to train, depending on what position they needed. And you know, that's what kind of gives you the drive to get in. And who so who who's you is Bomber still there at the time? Aye, Bomber still he's still the reserve manager and youth coach, so they they were still there. Uh, John McGregor was still there. Then they brought in like Jan Dirks was he had a youth mm -hmm. uh, Tommy, oh, it's Tommy Singh. Played with the winger. His brother was the uh, Dundee United. 
Oh, McLean. With Tommy McLean, I he came in. He, he came in to take the 18, sorry, and Bomber stepped up to the reserves in 21s. Mm. Uh, so it was, uh, it was... So you're doing all right. You've progressed a bit for your first interaction with Rangers. You're now um, 18, 17, 18 year old. And you get the, the nod one day you're, you're going to be playing for the first team. You're in a squad. What, what happened there? Well, the rule changed in it. The under it was brought in the under twenty one rule. So is that three in the bench or something? Or three two, in the squad? Two, yeah. two in the bench. They have two under twenty ones in the bench, but that, you could involve a goalkeeper. So at that point, Barry Nicholson was still eligible. They brought in the boy Luigi. Uh, I can't remember his second name, Rico, Riccio, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Gattuso's assistant manager. Yeah. They brought in him. <clears throat> so it was between, there was a they rotated about four or five years. Uh, so that got you involved. And then just through that, you were, you'd never think you were getting a game. And then Dick threw me on one night at Ibrooks. We were playing Dundee United. And uh, played a few games of that season. And then you, you get a taste for it. And then that's when we used to have numbers on with, with jumpers. And the first team had their, lit, their initials. Mm -hmm. And then you go into, like you're coming into training and your initials are on your tap. No, that was, it was brilliant for me having that. But uh, you kind of you kind of look too much in it because then you start thinking, oh, that's me made it. And, yeah. But to be fair, Dick put me in my place because I got caught. That was, that was nearly the end of the season. I played the games. Three or four games in a row. And then... We had a break for the, the summer and I get caught playing in a five side tournament. And Dick said to me, You're finished. That's sure you're done. And I'm like, What do you mean? And he's like, you're, You can't play in tournaments like that. And uh, I went, I, they sent me on, my agent got me a trial with Wigan to play in a game. It was, I think it was for Clyde Bank, Derek Ferguson, that was the manager at the time. <clears throat> so I went down and played in that game. Done well, and then Paul Joe was the manager of Wigan. He said to me, uh, we, "We can't." Well, he didn't say to me. He said to my agent, "Said we can't. We don't want to sign you because you play too much football." And that was at Wigan at the time of the, the championship and big one, and that was just long ball. Right. Just but like we were no looking for that sort of centre half. I was like, "Fine." So I ended up. I had to go back to Rangers, and uh, luckily for me, Dick had a bad spell, and uh, that's when he left and Ballet came in, and I got my chance again. But during that summer, were you basically <clears throat> putting yourself to other clubs and just try to get a move because of what he told you? No, no, it was, it was, uh, I never really knew what was happening because it was like the middle of pre-season or the middle of your break. And uh, I didn't know anything until I went back. I went back and then Bombers like, you need, you're training, you're, you're not training with the first team now, you're training with the, the reserves again. And uh, then never really heard that for months and then, He's like, Dick's like, you'll not know, be in the first team for what, for what happened. Hi guys, I'd just like to take a, a minute to talk to you about NordVPN, which is a company that I use their services. I use it majority of the time when I'm travelling abroad, when I want to uh, keep up to date with the programmes I'm watching at the time, or more importantly to me, um, the sports that I want to watch when I'm abroad. So it doesn't matter where I am in the world, I can still watch the channels and the games and the sports that I want to. It also gives me security and some privacy that I'm looking for when I'm browsing the internet. They've got an exclusive huge discount available to viewers of the podcast, and they'll give you an additional four months free on top of whichever package you go on if you use our, our code. To get that, plus a 30-day, no quibble, uh, money-back guarantee, all you need to do is log on to nordvpn.com backslash Craig, C-R-A-I-G, and that'll get you the exclusive discount plus the four months free on top of whichever package you go for. So go and give them a look, guys, and certainly I've had no problem using them in the times I'm travelling abroad when I mostly use them. Thank you very much. I say I was just lucky that he, he went through a wee bad spell and had to leave. He left. But in, in, in between that conversation and him leaving, there would have been suspensions, there would have been injuries, and there was just nothing, nothing. no getting near it at all? No, just reserve games. Uh, not, no, not anywhere near the first team. Uh, and at that he done the same thing to Charlie Miller and Dan McInnes they were playing first team and then they put them down to the reserves and they weren't involved with the first team either I think Derek got back in for one of the games he came back in for a Champions League game I think done well and then played a couple of games and then was back out again 
but that, that's just the way it was. And are you just thinking at the time that's that my Rangers career's over here? Yep. And then it was coming up to it was coming up to like Christmas. And I can remember my agent saying to me, like, there's Wolves are interested in taking you on loan. Uh who else is it? Ipswich, QPR, I think. Uh at that time thing was the manager of QPR. Haley? No. Uh was it Haley? No. Wilkins. Might it might have been Haley, but it was Wilkins with him. I'm not sure. Uh, I just Ray, Ray Wilkins was there anyway, because uh, it was him that that said, "Can we can we take him on loan?" And I was like, I would shit myself because obviously I've never been away from home, mm. and uh, just when I was ready to say I I want to go, then that's when Dick left, or he never left. He went upstairs, mm. and then Alec came in, and there was injuries, and in the first couple of weeks I was in the first team, and then I got a run run against the end of the season, and then signed a new contract. So was your contract just a year to go at that point? Yeah, I, my contract was up at the end of the season. Wow. So There's some change of fortune, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, going for that, you know, you never play again. You were getting loan, your contract's up in about six, seven months, and you're thinking this is the end of the journey. And then, what's your head like at that point? Well, I never, see, to be honest, I never really thought too much about it because I was, I didn't really want to think about it because mm. I, I, that's what I wanted to be, but... Uh, and it's, it's no nice to say, but I was glad that Dick had a, a shit spell because then obviously got me back in my opportunity. But uh, I don't, people say to me, do you hate Dick Avocat because he would have done it? I don't hate him because he was a great coach. He gave me my chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was my fault for what happened. But I thought he could have been because I was younger. I was only, I was probably only still 18 at that point. He could have maybe took me to the side and says, look, you're no near the first team, but try and build yourself back and get back in about it. And I've just, it was a point blank, no issue. So I had, luckily enough, because of the experiences through Bomber and all that, I had that bit about me that I was like, I still need to knuckle down and, and play with the reserves and do well there. And then if I need to move, then I need to move. Incredible. So what was Alec like? Is a uh, breath of fresh air for you? Uh, what was it yeah. training and stuff like that? Um, Tra- training didn't really change much because Jan Vilters was there. So he, he, he used to take all the training. Uh, the difference between both of the managers was Dick was hands on. He used to take part of the training, as, whereas Big Alec would just stand at the side and watch and then step in if he seen something they didn't like or step in if he wanted to see something to work on. But no, he, he was good for me, encouraging. Uh, just told me to get my head done. And I think it was like maybe eight or nine games left. I think I played seven in them. So he's like, it's up to you. Basically, you've got because Craig Moore got injured, and uh, he's like, it's up, it's up to you to go and uh, get a new contract. And when did they tell you you're, you're going to renew your contract? Did they wait to the, the, the summer, or did you have that no, conversation? Well, actually, it wasn't. Uh, I think I went away, and I, I don't know if they're all still the same, but I know that if you've come through the like the, the ranks or the system, uh, they kind of just release you, or they, they couldn't just release you. They had to at least give you training facilities until you got something else or whatever. So I, I still hadn't signed my contract when I went back for pre-season. They, they, they'd offered me one, but I hadn't signed it. And, uh, it was a wee bit more than £62.50. It was a wee bit more than that. It was a wee bit more than that. But uh, not much. <laughs> uh, but I can remember, like, going away in my summer holidays and at this point Kevin Muscat and that were signing. And uh, my agent's phoning me and saying, look, there's... I think there was a team in Italy that was interested. But it wasn't, it was like, came out, it was like Kevo or something. And I'm like, can I, can I go there and don't speak the language, don't do this. Uh, and then it was getting closer to going back to pre-season and not, nothing was happening yet. And then the officer said to me, look, the contract's here for you. It's up to you if you sign it or not. And I think after about maybe two or three days of pre-season, I signed it. And uh, what was, how long was that one for? Uh, I think that it was, that one might have just been a year, mm-hmm. a year's contract. And then I signed, I think maybe only six months into that season, I signed another two years. And then another year, I signed another like two years. But yeah. it was like, it wasn't, a, it was the same contract length, but it was just my money went up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it used to be brilliant because the chairman used to come in and he'd go like, fuck's sake, Bob, are you still here? 
<laughs> for fuck's sake. <laughs> um, but he was brilliant. He's just uh, he, and even did the mad run with the board players like that. He would he would drop the piss at them, and uh, they, they could, then they could really send him. No, he did a lot of influence in the club for a long time. You got to give him his place. Aye, uh, he, he did. To be fair, and I know I know that a lot of fans and a lot of people have given pebbles, but for me, he was he was he was great with me. And to be fair, he was one of the only ones when I left the club. He was one of the only ones that sent me a voicemail saying, listen, appreciate everything you've done, uh, trophies that you won for the club and that, so mm-hmm. go away and get stuck in and maybe see you back one day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, um, so David Murray, because of what happened at the end of his tenure with, you know, selling it for a pound to Craig White and then I had money within a year and all that stuff, um, I can understand why mm-hmm. he, some people has tainted his, his opinion and somebody asked me about it one day, what was my thoughts, and I said, look, See, for everything that you think he might have done bad, but he gave us nine in a row. He gave us Loudrop, he gave us Gaza. Um, and I'm not sure now that the Rangers revolution did start before him. A lot of people think he came and then soon as came and then mm-hmm. the world changed for Rangers. It didn't quite work that way. It was David Holmes that started it, getting Graham soon as in, and then um, Sir David Murray came a wee bit after that and I think took it to another level, to be fair. Um, so, you know, I think you've all, you, you can't. I think there's a big grey area what happened when Rangers got sold yeah. in 2011, which led to the admin in 2012. But you've always got to think, what if he didn't come at the start? And, you know, look at the tenure he had and the things that we, you know, we all witnessed as fans before you were lucky enough to play for the club. You were a fan of the club. Um, and, you know, he gave us a lot of that. So I, I'm not saying that he's, he shouldn't, people shouldn't question what happened with the pound and duped and all that sort of stuff. But I think to just concentrate on that, is a wee bit disingenuous, not only to David Murray, but also to that time in Rangers history. Yeah. Things were different then. I mean, oh, they were spoiled. Totally different. Totally. And, you're, and you've got to remember as well, it was, that was a time when you're on, it was a free fall rule. That's so right, it, was yeah. all Scott, it was mostly Scottish players and he built, built, up, built the stadium. Uh, listen, we were talking about this last night as well. See what you think about Man City and play, the City group and all this. I've got three or four different clubs all the world. David Murray seen that thirty years ago mm-hmm. and tried to try to do it like Northern Spirit. Yeah. Tried to do it in different countries because he knew how big Rangers were and had fans all the world. But obviously it never worked out the way that these clubs have worked out. But he had that vision years ago to do these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I definitely think I know I know what you're saying about the what happened at the end. It's obviously a, a grey area for, for fans and stuff in, in the club, but what he done for the club at the start and putting in what he put in. And I don't think you can knock him for that. And was he quite hands-on? Yeah, no, no hands-on. He was at every most of the home games. And he would come in, he'd come into training. He's just a normal, normal guy. You know, I know he had a, f- a few quid, but... And t- people like me, guys like me, we, we, we would try to fucking hide in the corridor for him because he'd be shitting myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? In case he said something to you. But uh, he was just a normal guy. He'd laugh and a joke. And... And it's just obviously he's not got any legs, so it's it's strange, and you you're, you you know, don't really know what to say to him mm-hmm. in case you say the wrong thing. But no, he was he was bang on, he was brilliant. Aye, no, no, fair play. So um, I Alex came. It's fair to say, sort of, I was going to say re, reject your career, but your career at that point's only what three, four games old. Um, yes. So it was almost didn't start, um, and he's reignited that. Um, and what was what was Alex teams like at the time? He he got the he he took over a, a great squad that Dick had mm-hmm. the boards Advert uh, Avaladzis uh, players like that, Big Ammo Craig Moore Fergie Arthur Newman all the, all these guys were still there but he just came in and gave them a a different belief basically uh, gave them a a a, rain, a lease of life to go and play again mm-hmm. but you've got at that time Celtic had a right good team as well. Uh, and it was we would win the league one year, they would win it the next, we would win it, they would win it. And then Alec came in, he won it, or he never won it the first year, he won the double the first year. Uh, I think he won both cups, didn't he? And then won the treble the next year. And then Gordon Stratton came in, he won it, and then Alec won it again. So the, the, the squads at that time, there was nothing nothing between them. And in your uh, advocate, three or four games, did you play against Celtic in any of them? I did, I played. My first start was against Celtic in the League Cup semi final. What's that like? That? What's that experience <laughs> like for you? Well, that was that was a weird one because uh, 
I remember we stayed at the Crawler Hotel up in East Bride. And uh, obviously, you're not thinking you're playing or you're. I think, I don't know if there was still a rule at that point. I know that there was a, there was a lot of injuries uh, in a certain half position. And uh, I can remember we stayed overnight in the Crowland. And it was a nighttime game. And uh, my dad phoned me about two o'clock in the afternoon. He's like to me, good luck tonight. You, uh, get stuck in. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you're playing? And I'm like, what? How, how, the, how do you know? And he's like, I just spoke to Big Andy Smiley. He said, Shut up. He said, you're playing. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, you're kidding me on. <laughs> so I was, I thought it was a wind up. So I goes back to my room. And to be fair, 20 minutes later, my phone goes, Dick Advocate, come to my room and he speak to you. And uh, he's like to me, when I take the back tonight, you're, you're playing the middle one. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you're, you're playing the middle centre half. And then that, that was it. Well, I'm, I'm glad he told me when he did rather than the night before because then that means you, you don't sleep you start thinking about things too much yeah. and you realize yeah it's amazing isn't it it's a, it's a league cup semi-final yeah. the biggest rivals massive game mm -hmm. and we've not done any shaping or anything before it where you've been put in this well, position we never see the really good thing about Dick he used to work on 11 v 11s all the time yeah. so we had worked on it but just no no like maybe me starting or whatever but Done maybe the, the opposite team that was playing with uh, like in a back three or whatever. And I think I, I think that night it was me, Big Scott Wilson and Bert Conman was a back three. I think Big Ammo was injured, and uh, to be and we played Celtic in the league maybe a, a week or two later as well. And it was basically the same team. We had to go to Parkhead with like a squad that was like all your, younger ones, mm. guys that weren't really playing much. And uh, we managed to get a one each draw. We get beaten in the League Cup game. I made a mistake. That was a game that Larson uh, hanged over Stefan. Uh, and I think mate, was it Mickey Moles or Claude Arena gets in half. I think they, they beat us 2-1. Uh, but what an experience. And actually, actually in the game, apart from the mistake that I made, I'd, I'd done all right. And then I think that they had that wee bit of trust in me that I could, they could throw me in. But then obviously in the summer, I, I messed it up. So, just thinking here, so you only played three or four games for Dick and two of them are against Celtic? Aye. aye. <laughs> That's no bad like, corner. Uh, no. But that, that was the, probably at that time, the League, the league Cup was, that was the only thing we could really play for against Celtic were a, a few points ahead of us at that time. Uh, and that was kind of the getting to the end for Dick. So, and that would have been at mm -hmm. So, I mean, what's that like? Had you played at Hamden before then? No. You only never. played schoolboys or you know, just, uh, just, any Mad Cup finals as a youth or anything? No, just straight in. Uh, like, there would have been the old dress rooms not then as well. Uh, I know it might have been, might have been the, like the, would have been done up against since, but it was a, it would have been just when it had been done up. Yeah. So yeah, it was what an experience, especially if it was a full, the full thing, it was my dad phoning me and saying good luck now. I was like, and then obviously I actually was playing. Uh, and it just shows you that, that people knew before anybody else what the team was going to be. Like Andy Pickett team, aren't they? So I, I don't know. I, I don't even know how he knew. I don't know. But uh, that, that's how it happened. And I was, I was like, oh, fuck's sake. But aye. Uh, so you're 17, 18 at this point. You don't know until hours before it you're playing. You're playing against Celtic. You're walking out to Hamden for the first time. What's that like walking out the tunnel that night? I, you can't you can hear it. You're concentrating in the game, and then like you line up, and then obviously all the Rangers fans are saying all the Celtic fans. So it's like a big rabble. And uh, but see when you're see when you're like lining up and you're concentrating in the game, you can hear it everything about. And then the worst thing is like obviously they do the huddle, yeah. and then that's when you like you start feeling fucking <laughs> blood starting to boil, and all the Rangers fans are going after them not. And then that's how, after that game, I used to turn away. See, when they used to do it, I used to turn my back and look at the fans. Because I didn't, I didn't want to see that. Because I knew that if I was too, too, like my emotions got yeah. better than me, I would do something stupid. Like I'd tackle or something. So I used to look away so that I never got too wound up. And the game itself, um, do you feel the pressure during that? Or is it, or, or can you can you dis disassociate yourself once it, where the whistle goes and the game starts? Well, I, I can remember having the old like shaky legs and... Do you know, like the energy's zapped for you for the first like five minutes. I don't know, something happened in the game where, uh, I don't know if it was big Scotty Wilson passed the ball to me and I went to kind of a, as if I was going to play it back to the goalie and I, I dummied it and like 
Chris Sutton ran past me and I just thought, I, I got confidence for that. Then I just got into the game. But no, it was, I, I, it's, it was a strange feeling because I, I remember going to Parkhead as well and even though they're singing all their songs and whatever, you, you, you can manage to blank out and you, can, you can't really hear much. It's something that, I, I don't know say it's diluted because it's still a big game, right? It's a, an amazing spectacle. But see, when you go to Hamden, I mean, even back then, when we went to Parkhead, we might get 8,000 tickets. They get everyone on load when they came to us, so they had maybe 7,500 at the time. And it was nuts, right? And then you would go to that game, and it was 50 50. I just think when, when we play Celtic at Hamden, I think a lot of stadiums, no, near mm-hmm. Ibrox, and to be fair, probably even more than the Celtic Stadium, I think it just turns the whole thing up. I know it's because it's a 50 50 yeah. thing. Um, and I think a wee bit of that's been diluted because, you know, the last while there was like seven and eight hundred fans in each and new, you know, the odd one where there's none. What, what do you think about that? Do you think it should be more or do you think it's all right the way it is? You know, as a player, what, what do you, you know? As a player, you, you want you want your fans there. You want, like, when you've got 8,000 fans at Parkhead, you want them there because they help. They, they do help. Mm-hmm. If you're having a hard game or not, not so much as a, like a player yourself as a team they, they can get you through it like if, they, if you do something good as a team you hear them all cheering and it gives you a lift uh, and it would have been the same for them coming to Ibrox but I can understand why they've done it because obviously they get the full stand at Ibrox we get put in a wee corner uh, I can understand why the club done it but as a player you want you want the fans there it's no, it's no. Had you ever played in a, a game where there was no um, visiting fans? Is that something that you'd, you'd come across in your career? I've played in a game where there was no fans. What was that? And the Milan Champions League. And I, another player that was on the bench. It was only hospitality fans, so Rangers could bring their like their flight load of hospitality. Uh, and the same went to Milan. It was their hospitality, but there was no fans in the ground. How bizarre was that? It's mental because you could hear it. Everything. There's, I've got Yakis now. Ah, ah, ah. He's he's in the stand and he's shouting to me, Oh, be a banger! <laughs> <laughs> and you can hear it echoing through the stadium. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, brilliant, man. Uh, but it was uh, it was weird, weird design. It was, didn't they, it was a flat game as well. It was near, I think ah. they beat us 1 0, but it was like flat. There was ah. no really any tempo to the game or anything. But uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a weird one. Through your, your European um, exploits, was this the biggest games you can remember through European nights? I can remember my, my first night going to... I knew I was at games before this, right? But I, did, I, did, I couldn't really remember them because I was too young. But I can remember going to the Leeds Rangers game at Ibrox. That was my first game that I could remember being at. Uh, my dad's pal took me. And uh, the atmosphere was unbelievable. And then, like, the best one to be part of playing in was like, the Inter Milan game at home. And they, they qualify for the, the knockout stage. Just the full the full build up to that, the having to wait at the end for a couple of minutes to see what was happening in the other game, right. and then getting told that the game was done and you're through. Uh, it was it was an unbelievable feeling. And saying that, but that was when like the fans were right behind us, and they were they were brilliant. The, the, the way they see that was here as in the European games, but it's electric. It was like that back then, and it was it was great to be a party. I ended up in hospital that night. I was in, I was working in uh, London at the time, Monday to Friday. I was raging, man, because what a season to miss European games. I was obviously up the road on a Friday night and I was able to go to the games at the weekend. So I spent that um, Champions League campaign watching it in the uh, Cock Tavern in London, which was underground at the Smithfield Market. And uh, we're obviously watching the Rangers game. And games done in the juicy, there was a, a bit of a... Uh, um, Media and Porto, Porto game still playing, and so we don't know if we're mm-hmm. qualified or not. And uh, there was three or four years in the pub, like a mental pub, mobbed. And um, phoning pals who are sitting in the house watching Sky, they're flicked out to tell, and then mm-hmm. oh, you're gonna apart, they're gonna apart, like, just shit, they're gonna apart, right? So there's three or four guys spread out in it, and I'm one of them, and I've got a corner, shit, I've got a corner, right? <laughs> it's mad, and the minute. <laughs> I sat through it, and I jumped up in there, and somebody sitting here must have moved their chair, and as my feet took off the ground, the chair legs went like that, and I came down, oh. and my ankle turned, I almost seen the sole of my foot, I was steaming, 
and I went back to my digs in uh, south side of London and uh, loitered and uh, woke up in the morning, went to go to bed, ended up in the flare. <laughs> Forgot you had done it? Aye, and uh, that was that size. So I remember that game well, and unfortunately, uh, I didn't get to any of the uh, European games that because of um, circumstance, but I got a great, um, great achievement. We should, um, we should have actually went further because we still beat Valeria as well. We actually let them back into the game at Ibrox. Uh, and then, boy, they must have a chance close to the end that would have put us through. Uh, but I think when you're, the teams that we played that that season, Porto, even they go to the group stage, Porto and Milan, even at Mead, I think we, we struggled against them when we played them. I think uh, they battered Celtic, was that just a year before? Or? I can't remember. I can remember going to play them away, Bratislava, and it was oh, wild, mental, uh, freezing as well. And I think, I think, I think we got, I'm sure we got a draw that night. And uh, that's what kind of serves up for the Milan game at home. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, oh, your European game, I mean, you played, you mentioned some of them, Milan's Milan's, um, Porto, Villarreal. Who else did you play against in your European ventures? Uh, I played the. Uh, Copenhagen game when we qualified at Copenhagen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I came on, uh, I came on the second half. Some Heringberg maybe got injured and uh, get put into that game. That wasn't a nice game to get put into because we were struggling. Mm-hmm. And we ended up short of Elijah scored an overhead kick and uh, we got a lift and then they scored and then we had to score again. But that was at the club at that time, nobody really knew what was happening because that was when Barry was getting told he was leaving or, or he was. Then he played that game because he was meant to be going to uh, Blackburn the next day or two. So <clears throat> the boys went out. And he was also the captain. So it was a, it was a strange feeling where he wasn't there. But they, they pulled through. It was a, that was a proper good good squad. That and you and Barry obviously have done a lot together in your life later on. You know, man, and managing and coaching and stuff like that. But when did you become pals? Yeah, it was a weird one because. I don't I mean, used to play in the Glasgow Cup, mm-hmm. so you I think you were allowed two overage players, and Fergie played in it sometimes. So he, he would come down and play with us, even though he was part of like, what was first team in that and the reserve team. And uh, he obviously he's Hamon, and I was Glasgow, and uh, my, how it really hanged me was I heard Derek mention it as well. He's a, his dad was a, a roofer, oh, yeah. and my dad used to uh, he wasn't he's not a roofer, but he used to hang, labour to them. Mm-hmm. And uh, he got to know Barry's dad. He was on Seriously? the jobs. Aye, and then obviously he's they've mentioned it, and he's went, "Oh, my son's there as well." And then so got got to know him like that. He would pick Barry would pick me up some of the days to go to training. Uh, <clears throat> just got to be pals that way. And then obviously I, when I got, he was in the first team, then I came into the first team. So what's the age difference between the two? Uh, must be maybe four years or something. Is it four, much as four, four, uh, Sure, it's uh, sure he's uh, maybe three or four years. I. So um, you won some trophies, two two titles, two cups. All right. So I won one two under Dick. No, never didn't need really to play much, uh, and I won two under Alec. And when you, I mean, I, I can obviously only speak from my own experiences and um, won some trophies when I was a kid. You know, playing football and fortunate enough to win some trophies with Sons of Truth, and it's, it's a great feeling. But and I've obviously witnessed Rangers winning loads of trophies during my time, and very very fortunate. What's it like in the park when you win a league and that whistle goes? So the, the both leagues I won under the Alec were, were both in the last day of the season, so it was it was more emotion than anything else. Just glad to go over the line. Uh, it's a real experience. I, I think that the Dunfermline won at home. Yeah, we were expected to battle them. Uh, <clears throat> I guess Sutton says it was planned. Oh, I know, but <laughs> I'm sure it was planned at Command. They get they get a doing as well, but. Listen, it was there they missed the penalty, so they can't blame anybody but themselves. Uh, we we knew that we had to, there was a job had to get done, and, I, and you've some fellas scored first that game as well. We were getting beat one now. So it's bizarre, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And then, and it was weird because even when the players were scoring, they weren't they weren't celebrating. They were just grabbing the ball and back. Did another one? And, uh, it was it six or seven? Any you know, Six. Incredible. And it came down to a penalty with Mikel Arteta. Oh, of course, aye. Uh, and that was maybe the last couple of minutes of the game, three four minutes of the game. And to be fair for a kid, because he's he's maybe a, a, I think he's maybe a year younger than me, or the same age. So put that pressure on yourself to go on. Even on an old bad career. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Still doing all right, the <laughs> uh, But 
to have that pressure on him, step up and, and slot it away and as if it was, he did it every day. It was, it was crazy. Uh, but no, it was it was mental. But the the, the Hibs one, I think we, there was a feeling that we won the going to date that day. No, you we no one had, we knew we'd won the game, but we didn't think it was going to be enough to like uh, win the league. And you know, obviously the, the things that happened in, in the Motherwell game was incredible. And still think about it, still seeing like Davy in the dock and obviously Big Billy Thompson's not here now. But uh, they were we were in the dugout and he's jumping and got that Motherwell scored and you're like fuck off Tom. He's like, I'm fucking telling you. He's like, they've no scored. He's like, they have. And then the next minute the Rangers are interrupted. Aye. And you're like, fucking hell they have. And uh, he done it again. He's like, they've scored again. Aye. You're like, aye, right. And the next minute they've erupted again. And I've never seen it. I, I don't know if you if, if you see it in the videos. We still had five minutes to play. But Hibs were, Hibs were in Europe. Mm. If, they, if the, result, the result stayed the same, Aye. Hibs were in Europe. And we had won the league. So they weren't the interested in going forward. We weren't the interested. We were just trying to keep the ball. And you've got Alec Ray running on, jumping on Barry's back. Aye, during the game. During the game. <laughs> and they're, they're like celebrating as if it's, it's done. And you see Fergie go, oh, no, you need, you need to keep <laughs> going. Or was it Fergie maybe I've jumped on Alec Ray's back? Uh, well, that was still five minutes to go. But it was mental. Mental. And then obviously the, the full time. Because we never had, we were in the other tracksuits. Didn't, weren't expecting anything. But luckily, Jimmy Bell was clued up. We had the t-shirts and all that already in a box under the Did bus. you not know about that? No. Never knew. He went, he'd done it all himself. Went and uh, pulled the, into the, into the bus, pulled the, the box out. He's got all that t-shirts. So then we've got the t-shirts, went back out onto the, got the trophy and celebrate in front of the fans. But never, never knew. I, I think they were, well, certainly second favourites in a two-horse race. Um, coming into the end of that season and although as a fan you always want your team to win I'm the same as you I, did, I just thought it's can't happen mm. can't happen you wanted it to happen there's no but deep inside you thought this isn't happening yeah. and uh, I went and cut the grass that day and I had the motor park the drive the windy down the, the radio one mm -hmm. I'm going, oh, I can't believe I can't do you know this and the boy next door to me at the time his um, father-in-law was um, an old Celtic really. Um Blantyre's terrible. John Fallon. Mad Celtic family, right? And I'm like, I know it's happening at 5 45 and this final whistle goes right. Um and I, I just remember hearing the read, I went, um, and the commentary that they gave on the radio was almost identical minutes later when me and McDonald's scored the second goal. It was like in the ball coming yeah. McDonald's and I had on it, right? And I'm like, ah. why the radio repeat? playing repeat? You know, they don't have to tell you, you'll see yeah. a repeat of a goal, but I'm thinking. And it took a couple up to it, it, it's it's sunk in. And by God, man, I couldn't believe it. And then I've ran in the house, I've just jumped about mad. But to be there, be, be, be. see see that full day, Craig, it was like obviously gone because normally we would I can't even remember if we stayed overnight. Normally if we played Tibbs and Hearts, we would go and stay overnight. But I, I don't even think we did. I think we travelled on the day of the game. Uh obviously with tracksuits, like a big occasion like that, we would have the club suit on. We had our tracksuits on. Uh and then after games, games like that, there would have been a big spread put on where your family and that can come back. And we, after the game, we were on the bus back to Ibrox. We'd done a two, well, saying that, sorry, before they didn't know if they were going to let the fans in. Yep. And then there was that many outside that they had to let them in. So they, they said, right, we're going to give you maybe an hour or something, let the fans come, let them fill the stadium. So we were sitting in the Thorn Suite. Everybody was starving, had nothing to eat. <laughs> they, they had a, we were all been drinking on the way back in the bus. Uh, so they had to send one of the security guards to McDonald's. Oh, yeah. And I swear to God, they came back with like 25 Big Mac meals or chicken meals. And that's Helicopter what Sundays. That's what the player was eating. <laughs> mental. And when you tell people, ah, oh, good one. I'm, like, I'm telling you that's what happened. I really appreciate the hours that some of you are investing into watching the podcasts that we've done in the past. But I'd like to ask you to do me one favour that would take you seconds. If you enjoy the show, please hit the subscribe button. And if you enjoy any show in particular, please click on the thumbs up. It'll make a massive difference to the podcast. So thanks very much for your continued support, feedback, and I hope you enjoy this one.